The president arrived for his State of the Union speech. Everyone expected him to issue an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein. They were not prepared for what came first. Today on the continent of Africa, nearly 30 million people have the AIDS virus. Yet across that continent, only 50,000 AIDS victims, only 50,000 are receiving the medicine they need. I ask the Congress to commit $15 billion over the next five years, including nearly $10 billion in new money, to turn the tide against AIDS in the most afflicted nations of Africa and the Caribbean. Few could have imagined that we'd be talking about the real possibility of an AIDS-free generation. But that's what we're talking about. That's why we're here. The ultimate tool will be a vaccine. And scientists are making great progress. Finally, as you, I'm sure, have read in the papers, Given the fact that we now have the virus in our hands, it is quite possible, in fact it's invariable, that we will develop a vaccine for AIDS. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Why do you believe that HIV does cause AIDS? Because that's all the information that I've been given. Because we've never been taught anything different. We have uh, we have heard it. Because that's what the scientific community has told us. Scientists are supposed to observe, experiment, and reason from what they observe. They're not supposed to grab hold of an idea and cling to it and adjust everything else in their perceptions to fit that idea. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, the probable cause of AIDS has been found, a variant of a known human cancer virus. Second, not only has the agent been identified, but a new process has been developed to mass produce this virus. Thirdly, with discovery of both the virus and this new process. We now have a blood test for AIDS. With the blood test, we can identify AIDS victims with essentially 100% certainty. You know, it was a political proclamation of scientific truth. Um, Robert Gallo successfully lobbied Margaret Heckler, who was then the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to proclaim his view of what caused AIDS to be absolute scientific truth. And she went on with him in tow and announced that. The conference was held before any of Robert Gallo's papers were published, therefore before any other scientist had a chance to review them and uh, look at the evidence and see if he got it right or wrong. And it was also done right when Gallo had patented uh, the HIV antibody test. So they made sure that his patent rights were protected first, then they did the press conference, and then, before Gallo's papers appeared in print, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services decided from now on, we are only going to fund AIDS research that assumes that Robert Gallo's virus is the cause. We are not going to fund research into any other possibilities. Therefore, the scientists who might have wanted to critique Gallo's papers would not be able to do so, at least uh, not with um, anything supported by the federal government, which is virtually all science in this country today. Just because Bob Gallo gets up, takes his like sunglasses off and says, gentlemen, we discovered the cause of AIDS. That's all we have. New York Times article, CDC report, that's all we have. That's not enough. That's not enough to, to you know, that is not sufficient to, to like publish even a, a meager little scientific paper somewhere, that isn't enough for scientists to believe some inconsequential fact about some star 50 light years away. You know, that's certainly not enough to treat 
at the cost of million, billions of dollars a year and at the cost of a lot of lives and anguish and just destroyed, uh, you know, lives have just been totally ruined by this thing on the basis of some flimsy little statement made by a guy who's known to be a crook in lots of other ways. He lied about a whole lot of other stuff. Why are we trusting that? If he was a witness in the courtroom, we wouldn't trust his testimony. We've caught him in too many lies. You don't trust him anymore. At the University of California in Berkeley, Duesberg became a world-renowned retrovirologist in the cancer program and the first man to map the genetic structure of retroviruses like HIV back in 1970. His honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences due to his discovery of cancer-causing genes. Having researched retroviruses for over 30 years, some have called him the world's foremost expert in retrovirology. Dr. Duesberg was somewhat skeptical of Gallo's AIDS virus announcement. I wasn't madly impressed by it because what else would you expect from a person like Gallo who had studied retroviruses all his life that he would say retrovirus is causing AIDS. That seemed to be the first coincidence that made me wonder whether that was an authentic claim or going to be an authentic claim but um, I would say uh, it was not a surprise that he would say that he said it before that it would cause leukemia or things like Alzheimer's disease, neurological diseases, and it failed. So I was, one, I was not too impressed that this would, was going to be a winner now. And it would have been for the first time that a retrovirus would have been pinned down as a cause of a human disease or even a disease in wild animals. For 18 months, Peter Duesberg studied every scientific publication on HIV and AIDS he could get a hold of. When he finally published his observations in cancer research in 1987, he stood alone against the tide of popular opinion and the government-funded AIDS industry. His position has become well known. He argues that HIV is not causing AIDS. It's a harmless passenger virus that has lived in humans for centuries without causing diseases. He believes AIDS is the result of other non-infectious factors like drug use. And ironically enough, AZT, the highly toxic medication prescribed to treat AIDS patients, actually does what the virus cannot, that is, causes AIDS itself. Though Dr. Duesberg's arguments were ridiculed by many and ignored by most, many of his colleagues studied his research and came to the same conclusion. Something is terribly wrong with the war on AIDS. Dr. Richard Stroman recalls the impact of Duesberg's arguments in cancer research. It was a remarkable review, and it raised the fundamental issues about virus, virus, uh, uh, viruses as a cause of both cancer and, and immunosuppression, uh, basic questions that haven't been really responded to in any meaningful way in, in, uh, in the almost 10 years since that paper was published. Soon other top scientists joined Duesberg and Stroman in questioning the HIV hypothesis also. Nobel Prize winners Dr. Walter Gilbert of Harvard and Kerry Mullis who invented the PCR. Dr. Charles Thomas, a former Harvard professor, organized a consortium of 12 signatories to address the issue. They would in time become the group for scientific reappraisal of the HIV AIDS hypothesis. We started out by uh, writing a letter to Nature calling for a reappraisal of the evidence for and against the hypothesis that HIV did in fact do all these things and um, there were about 10 or 12 signatories to this letter and it was rejected even though many uh, of the signers of the letter were certainly reputable people we tried Nature magazine and it, it was ignored then we tried the New England Journal JAMA and so forth and Lancet in each case we were rejected that they would not publish this letter. It was only four sentences long. It read, um, it is widely believed by the general public that a retrovirus called HIV causes a group of diseases called AIDS. Many biomedical scientists now question this hypothesis. We propose a thorough reappraisal of the existing evidence for and against this hypothesis be conducted by a suitable independent group. We further propose that critical epidemiological studies be devised and undertaken. And that is certainly a hardly a bomb-throwing letter, but nonetheless they would have none of it. And being rejected made us angry. 
So we decided to extend the list of signatories. So it jumped to 30, and then to 50, and then to 100. And then by 1994, up to 600, 188 of whom have advanced degrees. We publish a newsletter. We have a website. So it's a fairly large organization now. Though the scientific establishment has continually ignored Duisburg and the group for reappraisal, some individuals are having second thoughts. At the San Francisco International AIDS Conference in 1990, Dr. Luc Montagnier, who discovered the virus originally six months before Gallo's claim, made a startling statement. HIV might be harmless. Against his own interest, Montagnier's statement should have been earth-shaking. But the conventioners paid it little attention and went right on talking about new antiviral drug treatments. Why is the scientific community ignoring the dangerous ramifications of this essential question about the cause of AIDS? Do we have an answer? Yes, in retrospect we certainly do. Too many people are making too much money out of it. And money is much stronger than truth. In 1987, the war on AIDS took another drastic turn for the worse. AZT, a toxic chemotherapy deemed too poisonous for cancer treatment, was approved to treat symptomatic and asymptomatic HIV patients in an attempt to kill the virus that causes AIDS. AZT is a DNA chain terminator, a poison designed to randomly destroy the DNA synthesis of reproducing cells. It was initially developed to treat leukemia victims, but after animal testing, the FDA determined that it was too toxic for use in human beings and banned it. But in 1987, when the AIDS scare hit its height, the FDA was pressured into approving the drug for use for the first time in human beings, even for people who were healthy and showed no sign of AIDS. AZT is highly mutagenic, meaning that it destroys the genes and cells and has been shown to cause cancer in rodents. It targets the bone marrow where B lymphocyte blood cells are being made. These are the very cells an AIDS patient needs most for immunity. AZT destroys randomly bone marrow, kidneys, liver, intestines, muscle tissue, the brain, and central nervous system. Peter Duisburg claims AZT actually causes AIDS itself. AZT is directly causing AIDS and defining diseases. You know, AIDS is a lot of the things, but it doesn't cause Kaposi sarcoma, I think, but it does cause immunodeficiency. It was designed to do that. It was designed to kill human cells. In fact, the manufacturer says that uh, specifically that it can cause uh, AIDS-like diseases. And the manufacturer, that is Bill Welcome, says it is often difficult to distinguish adverse events possibly associated with cedovudine or cedovudine administration, which is ACT, from underlying signs of HIV disease. In other words, even they acknowledge, not just this, but that, CD, uh, that AZT causes AIDS or AIDS-defining diseases. In his book, Poison by Prescription, journalist John Lawrenson explains how AZT tests conducted by the FDA and Burroughs Welcome, the manufacturer, were scientifically sloppy and outright fraudulent. During the experiments, patients taking AZT became anemic, suffered low white blood cell counts accompanied by vomiting. Over half had to have blood transfusions. 20% were transfused several times. Despite a warning by FDA toxicology analyst Harvey Chernoff that AZT not be approved, the FDA was pressured by AIDS activist organizations to lift the ban, and hundreds of thousands of people began taking AZT, even though AZT cannot cure AIDS and is only supposed to slow down the progression. The mortality rate trended towards being better in the sense of less deaths in the remdesivir group. 8% versus 11% in the placebo group. It has not yet reached statistical significance, but the data needs to be further analyzed. The logic behind AZT treatment is flawed, even if one believes HIV causes AIDS, because HIV only infects about one T cell in 1,000, 999 healthy T cells must die to kill the one cell that is infected and this can only happen early on before HIV becomes dormant and is still making DNA. Yet AIDS patients are given AZT for months on into years randomly destroying DNA in all parts of the body. 
AZT is expensive and costs between $8,000 and $12,000 a year, most of which is paid for directly or indirectly by the taxpayer. Burroughs Welcome, now Glaxo Welcome, the manufacturer, has generated sales over $1 billion a year with AZT. Because of rules allowed by the FDA, a bottle of AZT that costs about $5 to make can be sold for over $500 as a prescription, and much of this markup is being subsidized by the taxpayer. The treatment causes a very similar condition we would expect from an AIDS patient. That's why nobody noticed that there was something wrong with the treatment. I remember in 1992 after I first tested positive I became involved in an organization called Women at Risk. There were 11 of us at the time on the board and involved in the group. All of us except three were on the medications. In the year and a half that I was involved with Women at Risk, every single woman in that organization on the drugs died. Every single one except the three of us who weren't taking them.